Hey, everybody, welcome to the broadcast. I'm your host, Greg Bendian. And I got to tell you, this this one is a biggie for me. I have uh, I have been a fan of the music of Gentle Giant since my teenage years in the 1970s, growing up in New Jersey, in Teaneck. And uh, my friend Tim Blackman played me an album called Power and the Glory. And I worked backwards and forwards from that. But uh, we have so much to talk about today uh, with a very special guest and really one of my musical heroes, Mr. Derek Shulman. Hi, Derek. Hi, man. Nice to see you. And uh, thank you for inviting me on your show. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to have you. Uh, as listeners know, we've had Malcolm Mortimer and John Weathers on the program who have uh, told us some very enlightening tales about their time with one of the greatest bands of our lifetime, Gentle Giant on the road in the studio, conceptualizing the whole thing. I mean, as, as a young composer, and uh, I, I wasn't sure if I was gonna do this, but, but Derek, let me get this out of the way. I wanna read the essay, little essay that I wrote for the 1996 album by my group Je uh, Interzone, Greg Bendian's Interzone. And we dedicated the album to Gentle Giant. And this is, this is what I wrote then, and I stand by it. Okay. Growing up in New Jersey during the 1970s, I was exposed to a great many British progressive bands. Compositionally, the most important of these bands by far was Gentle Giant. Their freehand album changed my ears for life. In Gentle Giant's complex brand of chamber music, I heard for the first time, quite unwittingly, such diverse elements as counterpoint, hocketing, atonality, polytonality, polymetrics, metric modulation, rhythmic displacement, multi-instrumentalism, and of course, percussion as a featured voice. All vital areas of contemporary composition, which I would later study seriously as a musician. 20 years hence, while making a rediscovery and extended examination of Giant's work, I realized what a profound and lasting effect their music and musicianship has had on my own approach to composition and the band concept. This recording is dedicated to the members of Gentle Giant, Carrie Muneer, Derek Shulman, Ray Shulman, Gary Green, Phil Shulman, John Weathers, with much admiration, respect, and gratitude. Greg Bendian, August 1996. Wow, that is quite a, that's quite a statement, Greg. <laughs> and, I, and, and I appreciate it, certainly. Uh, your 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 um, description of uh, all the isms <laughs> uh, were were some pretty, pretty uh, spot on actually. I was I was listening you know to see what else you had up your up your uh, sleeve there, and you pretty much hit everything. Did I? Pretty much. It was melody melody too. Yes. You didn't hit the melody. Yes, you are right, and and that that's. I should apologize for that. That is odd. But no, I guess I'd assumed it. I don't know. The, the things that surprised me, I'd heard melody in other bands. Let's put it that way. So, but your special use of melody and also the, uh, the vocal arranging, and I'd love to talk with you in depth about that, but, uh, the, you know, the, the, the yin and yang of your voice and Carrie's voice and, and just the way that the whole thing is just so put together. And, and if you're a serious musician in your teens and you're exposed to Giant, as, like I say, unwittingly, you are imbibing all of these musical concepts in a freaking rock band. So well, that's what we were, a rock band. I mean, you know, the, all of the various things, the isms, if you like, the, that uh, you described there uh, um, are, are correct, however, um, we consider ourselves to be a rock band first and foremost. Um, you know, yes, we you know we try to, but the bottom line is we try to be better musicians for each other first, uh, and, and that's probably uh, the most selfish thing the band can do, as opposed to you know uh, going out there and and uh, you know um, getting your audience or or you know, in this day and age going on TikTok with, without any kind of. Uh, any um, sometimes any talent. I'm, I'm not going to say any more about that. But yeah, that was uh, the mo most important thing was gathering 
the musicians that we wanted around us, which became our band, and being better for ourselves so that we can do these uh, various uh, switches of time signatures and 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 uh, just because it was fun. It was, and I, we, we love to surprise ourselves first and then an audience. Uh, but one thing we, we, we were talking before we went on air is that um, the one thing that uh, I will say is that we never t took ourselves seriously. You know, yes, we were serious musicians. Yes, we love to to do something interesting and, and sometimes uh, surprising, but we were never, we never took ourselves seriously. We took the music seriously, but we wanted to have the, the people that saw us and, and, and heard us uh, have a smile on their face and, and, and not look at their shoes and, and, listen, and, and think or, or believe that we're listening to the LSO doing a, a Wagner, you know, a ring cycle, if you like. Uh, so that was important to us. It, it's such an interesting discussion there too, Derek, because if anyone has not seen Gentle Giant perform, put it on YouTube, go go, go find, a, 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 there's a Belgian, I think, broadcast or a German broadcast or something that, that shows just how much fun it is and how, how facile these guys are in going from instrument to instrument and, and, and rhythmically always feeling great and uh, always clarity in as many as four subjects being engaged at the same time. Total clarity. Uh, everyone's independently got their own thing going. I mean, Derek, the time in that band, that's just the sense of rhythm in that band where John doesn't have to put the hi-hat down and everybody knows where everything is, like Advent of Panurge, where you have those right after Look of My Friends and you have that that contrapuntal line that's going to lead into the riff. There's there's just an incredible flow there, and that's why I kind of branded you guys as a rock chamber ensemble. What do you think of that? Um, I think it's interesting as a this description, uh, but you know, yes, yeah, so we I, I guess Carrie's influence, of course, uh, having um, you know a degree in composition and percussion from the Royal Academy of Music was obviously very important uh, to the brothers, you know, and uh, Ray's, you know, Ray was classically trained as well. I mean, you know, that was, uh, he was going to be the, he was training as a violinist to be you know, tutored to be in the National Youth Orchestra of Great Britain. And of course, I, I, I stopped both of them pursuing their, uh, their supposed careers and said, let's put a rock band together instead. But they had that level of talent. Absolutely, of course. And it comes from your dad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my father... My father was a professional jazz musician, but he was also, uh, he loved classical. Uh, he, he was a band leader. He was a trumpeter. And we had music around our house all the time and, and lots of instruments. The one thing you, 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 you talk about here, and we, we did, in fact, was we were able to, for some, you know, some parts of our set, if you like, pick up other instruments and play them. My father had the same incredible, uh, uh, you know, he had this unbelievable talent to be able to pick up a sax or a trumpet or a bagpipe and and or whatever and play them, but not to play them, just get a few notes out, but play them incredibly well after five minutes. So I guess the, the, the DNA filtered down to the kids um, some, somehow or other. Maybe specific question, but I'm curious to the level of your dad's love of modern jazz. Was he a Stan Kenton fan? Oh, absolutely. Major, major Stan Kenton fan. Yeah, that Stan Kenton, uh, you know, we, you know, we're talking about bebop, the bebop era. Um, but Stan Kenton band was was a Count Basie. Yeah. Yeah, but certainly Stan Kenton was a one. It was, it was on our record player, which we could hardly afford in those days. But it was on all the time, as well as Shorty Rogers, you know, Charlie Parker, you know, Chet Baker, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and uh, as well as, you know, um, Tchaikovsky and, and Vivaldi and et cetera. So, you know, and pop. We, you, know, we, you know, it was all part of, if it was good pop or not good pop, whatever. Music was all around, was around us all the time. I thought, you know, growing up that that was normal in a household. Well, of course, you know, I didn't realize that ours was an unusual household to, to be, to be to be growing up in you know when my dad came back from gigs 
um, at night, about 11, 12 or one o'clock, he'd bring a couple of friends home um, and someone from, you know, a, a touring musician from, from the States and play at home. I mean, literally play jazz, free form, sort of, you know, modern jazz till four or five in the morning. He loved it that much. So, free, free form? Free, yeah, free form, yeah, sometimes, yeah. I mean, and I, 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 yeah, but more free form. I, I'd creep down, I was upstairs getting ready for school, but I had to come down and say, can I listen? My elder brother, Phil, yeah, you know, he was, uh, we'd, we'd come down and, and Ray would hear. Yeah, it was, it was part of our lives. It's, a, it's the same thing, but yeah, absolutely. So that's literally the house, the street, the room? Yes, it is. The front, the front room. You're blowing so, my mind, sir. Well, so I want to talk about Phil because I don't know that Phil is fully appreciated in the scope of what you all were doing and accomplishing. And I wonder if you could shed some shed some light on because I know he's the the transitory figure he's he's the transition in saying we're going to go to now this area of music instead of the simon dupree and go more progressive and and we're going to call it something else and it's going to be this kind of thing tell me about phil in that regard well it was it was probably you know phil was you know, phil was 10 years older than you know uh ray uh, ray you know is a year younger than me so we were we had a we we're kind of a different generation um, but you know, I, I co opted Phil to be in, in the first group we were in, Simon Dupree in the Big Sound, because he, he could afford a van and uh, he, he was a teacher. We, we couldn't, I was at grammar school at that point. Um, anyway, but Phil, um, what I mean, it is still is, I mean, he's an incredibly intelligent, intellectual kind of person, but, but um, and incredibly well read, uh, and um. But you know, yeah. But but he was a part of our our discussion about the. Uh, we decided, you know, the three of us, to stop being in a pop group, which is we had a couple of pretty big hits, and it became Millstones ran our next, effectively, because we were we were getting much better as musicians, and we were being stymied by the fact that we were supposedly supposing the. Uh, pay, Wait, the, waiting for an audience, an audience waiting for us to play the hits rather than doing something which we were developing. And we said to hell with it. And actually, one of the people that we had in the band for a period of time was incredibly supportive of that was Elton John, Reg Dwight. Uh, Reg actually did was was blown away by <laughs> this is going to be a, this is a bizarre story. I still call him Reg, not Elton. Sorry. Um, was uh, because he, he did a couple of tours with us and he wanted to be in the band because he saw that we were pretty damn good musicians. And he said, boy, you guys are really, really good. Yeah. And you know, he was good himself. Um, and I told him we were thinking of uh, changing. And he said, you should, because you're, you're, you guys are you know, too good to play these scampy and chip circuits where, you're waiting, where the audience is waiting for the big hits. He was intrinsic in that. So, uh, Phil and myself and Ray um, stopped the band, the first band, and we were lucky that we had uh, a manager who believed in our musicality, and we were able to put together a band that had the same musical aspirations, if you like. Uh, the first person we recruited, of course, was was Carrie, and that but was. But tell me incredible... about that. How how does that happen? It's such a bizarre, uh, I mean, you want to know about Phil. I mean, Phil, well, I mean, Phil was important in this. Uh, Carrie, Carrie uh, Phil had, um, he had a big house and he had a lodger staying with him who mentioned that he knew someone in a band that was stuck in Germany who went to the Royal Academy of Music and played keyboards. Um, we, we, we put ads out in, in, in English newspapers and he said, okay, who's that? And, and anyway, the bottom line is we got in touch with him. He was stuck in Hamburg or, or, or somewhere. Um, and um, it was, again, we didn't, we didn't know anything about this. This is someone who knew someone that knew someone about called Carrie Veneer. Um, and he got in touch with Carrie. Carrie called. And we said, Would you, when you get back in England, can you 
would you like to come and audition? And we listened to Kerry and what he had. I said, okay, he's he's the guy we've been looking for for you know, a year. Um, and luckily, Phil had a very big house. You know, he could at a point we, we we did very well in the first group, and he actually stayed with Phil for you know uh, certainly several several months while we were rehearsing. Um, so that was you know that was the beginning of the the band, and then we were looking for guitarists, of course, um, and uh, we we must have uh, auditioned probably fifty to sixty of them. And, yeah, because and, now it gets dicey because the level of musicianship in the Shulman family meets the level of musicianship in the Royal Academy. Now there's a simpatico there. There's a seriousness there. Now you got to find a guitarist and a drummer. Right. Well, we we well we had uh, the drummer as a, at the last uh, very last uh, part of Cyber Dupree was a jazz drummer, Martin Smith, and Martin lived in the area. He was he was great for a certain period uh but more yeah you know, and and i'll get into that in a minute but uh, more important was was finding the right guitars because you know we're a rock band we 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 yes we are we a uh, uh rock chamber music uh back i don't know but certainly guitars in a band certainly was very important and and gary uh came along with his brother who was in the soft, soft machine at that point uh um gary uh and um the first thing he said was, can I tune up? And we thought, shit, this guy's, sorry, excuse me. This, <laughs> this guy might be good because he was the first guy that actually asked to tune up. Can you give me an E? Wow, <laughs> he's in. You know, and then, <laughs> he got the gig. <laughs> he got the gig, right, can I tune up? What a, what a concept, you know. Uh, but no, he, he's playing, I mean, he was a real blues player. And, and, and we could tell but his licks and, and his ability on the frets and the keyboard on the, on the as a fretboard that man this guy could play uh, and he was a little he was a couple of years younger but and he was i think a little bit overwhelmed but but he didn't uh, show it um and i think his after the rehearsal and his brother said man you should do it you should get get that go go for that gig we offered him the gig and gentle giant was born in 1970. uh so that's you know and that was you know basically phil phil and myself were the ones auditioning and, and, and leading the 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 uh, the putting together of the band effectively. And we so that's that was it until uh, and I did the lyrics for the most part. Uh, Ray and Carrie would do for the, for the most most of the music, but I also wrote, contributed. Yeah, you know, I'd say about fifteen to twenty percent of the music. Um, and we started writing for the first album so 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 who's coming up with the initial material uh and no who's arranging the initial material how does the arranging process go when stuff comes in with a lot of written material well um we, you know we we didn't well one thing we did not do is jam jam in a rehearsal that was never happening we didn't you know go into a rehearsal hey john you know put Give us four to the bar and let's see let's see what we can do we never went in like that ever throughout the whole band's history you know either ray and carrie and i said myself occasionally would come up we'd have our revoxes and we do sound on sound right. and um come up with either a riff and, or or something longer or even a kind of semi-written song oh we've heard the carry we've heard the carry piano demos sure yeah of course so so and then we'll we'll we'd reach out to each other, yeah, you know, myself, Ray, and 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 Carrie, and and fill it out, and then we bring it to the band, and the band in rehearsal would fill it out even more. So and that was that that was pretty much what how we did it for the most part all through the the uh, the years. But but for the first album, it was really kind of like scrambling to get our sound together, which is kind of hopefully different to what we did prior to that. Um, so that's, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I, I, it's incredible because, uh, there's, you know, the one area I mentioned that I really would, <clears throat> would like to dig a little bit more in is the fact that giant embraced dissonances that were not common in other progressive rock bands. And I wonder if I could sort of twist your arm a little bit. And if, if you could tell me if 
was Carrie into Hindemith? And like, what were you guys really getting that from? That that naughtiness, that that density. Well, Carrie, yeah, we were we were all into different kinds of things, and and, and we were, we loved to surprise. We loved to surprise ourselves. Yeah, Carrie and John Cage, you know, uh, Stockhausen, if you like, uh, these 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 composers, but they were they were certainly regarded by us. But we also loved, you know, as I said, melody. We loved the the, the classical melodies, and also and also other musicians, certainly that uh, like a Frank Zappa, who would do who was very much an influence actually on the group. Uh, even, you know, in, even when, when Mothers and the Mothers came out, when we were in our first band, we, were, we said, man, we, you know, we could do this. This is what we want to do. Not, you know, not what we're doing right now, which is, you know, playing to a Scampi and Chips audience in Stockport, uh, England, waiting for the pop song. Uh, so that was, you know, this is kind of where we were. And you've heard the clip, it's on YouTube, where they ask Zappa, what bands do you admire? Gentle Giant. Yeah, I have. And that's actually quite, uh, you know, I have to say very much um, uh, thrilling to hear that he would bring, you know, bring our, our band into the conversation. It was, we played with him, of course, uh, several times as well. Uh, and it was, it was a treat. I mean, we were, were very, I mean, we respected each other personally, but musically. Um, and that's you know, something which we always loved. So you, you, were, you were known to, to the musicians. I mean, clearly there's a culture there where people are, have you on the bill with yes, and people would have you guys, you know, playing the same size halls as, I don't know, Soft Machine and, and these kinds of bands, and if not, but if not a bigger. I mean, at its peak, Giant was playing to what, what size halls? Oh, it depends on where. I mean, certain parts of uh, the world. I mean, Italy, and Germany, and 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 some part. I mean, Canada. We played to 20,000 20, seaters. In as Quebec, a right? Quebec, yeah. Montreal, Quebec City, and and even Toronto, and and even uh, the bigger uh, cities here in in North America, New York or or L.A. We played the Shrine for two nights. Would sell them out. Um, Again, it wasn't it wasn't the uh, the, the Hollywood Bowl, but we, which we did play, by the way, the first tour uh, with with Black Sabbath. But uh, certainly, um, we were we were popular enough to play some pretty damn big places uh, in in Europe. You know, in, in Germany, there were you know fifteen thousand, ten thousand seaters. Same thing as in Canada um, and other other parts of the world. Um, not in England. England never took to us very well. I have to tell you, it's kind of funny, but it's also quite uh, grating, is that when the Interzone record came out and it was reviewed in London's magazine, The Wire, they spent more time bashing Giant than they did talking about my band and my music. And I found that so peculiar that they could be so closed off. Now, this is the 90s, so it's 20... You know, it's 12 years after Civilian, which I want to talk with you about, of course, and the reissue. But it's just it's so strange to me how now the level of appreciation for Giants music is skyrocketing. And all of these new reissues and all of these new uh, hearings are changing people's minds or opening people's minds or redirecting people back to the I fact like that, it. look, look, Giant was doing all of these things and they were part of a musical culture that included Jethro Tull, that included Yes, that included Genesis, that included King Crimson, that included Emerson, Lake and Palmer going out with an orchestra. And it was a kind of musical maximalism occurring in popular music if rock is a form of pop music, which I think it is. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite incredible to me that this exists. And tell me what you think of this idea. I think that this is all predicated, this audience, this bubble that we experience in this time period. And I know you're a music industry guy, so you've probably thought about this. Isn't the popularity of that music that we experienced in the 70s the result of music education being available to people as a, a thing that you did if you were middle class or even if you were just going to school? Didn't you just have music courses that could give you the basics? 
yeah, of course, you know, that's, yeah, that's what something that we all, I was, I grew up with, of course. Now I think, but I also think that, uh, that the internet and the availability of um, a younger generation, I mean, for good and bad, uh, whatever, but certainly availability to see and hear what has been done musically uh, in the past. And, and, and it's interesting that, um, as I was, we were talking about before we were um, recording, uh, that, um, that there's a lot of young people and young musicians who, instead of you know, uh, putting their uh, laptop and, and putting GarageBand on and, and pretending they're a band and or you know, these auto-tuned uh, um, whatever they do on the computer, they're watching and listening to music, which is which is um, which we had to learn to play. I mean, music, the instruments we had to learn to play. And in fact, um, one of the highlights for me actually uh, of of that situation was my son uh, putting together uh, a video during the lockdown period of proclamation from uh, the power and the glory because he'd seen so many fans playing along with the group, and he said, you know, why don't why don't I do this? And there was literally hundreds and hundreds of people who who, who uh, sent in their interpretation of and on various instruments. And I mean, poor Ray had to uh, to mix it uh, with you know 120 tracks. Um, but it turned out it turned out superbly because you can see that there was it wasn't just old farts like me doing. doing I, I love was, the proclamation video. Love the fan was, video. Yeah, oh. the fan video. It was, it was, you know, pretty. It was, it was great. I loved it too, and I still love it because it was. You could see the the these musicians who were who wanted to be really good, and and were playing along, having a good time playing along with 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 a band, and that's great. I love I love seeing that. I love I love being part of it. It was so gratifying. It must have been. I mean, it's uh, it's the and first. We, we, and we even played all of us. And you all play, and Phil's there too. And Phil's there too, absolutely. And his family. Everyone was there. We all had a party during the lockdown. That was an incredible moment. I, I just, it, it gave us so much energy. And it's it's just part of this whole celebration now and appreciation of Giant. You know, and it goes on. And, and I, I don't mind mentioning to, to people that this is the 50th anniversary of both Three friends and octopus this year. That's uh, yes, that's correct. That is that's not correct. a small thing. Well, I I, I don't know. I, I can't I can't say yes well, or no. Let, let, well, let me put it to you this way: This is what was happening in 1972. Zappa had just another band from L.A. Grand Wazoo, uh, Grand Wazoo, um, Captain Beefheart, Spotlight Kid. Miles Davis on the corner. Uh, let's see, my eyesight is is failing me here. But oh, fifth fifth uh, so soft machine trilogy ELP, living in the past, thick as a brick. Right. Yeah, uh, that was the cl close to the edge at some point there. You close to the edge, yes. Uh, Fox trot. OK, so so there's this is the culture that that Gentle Giant is releasing three friends and octopus and octopus is the last fill. Yeah. But Phil is really cooking in this period because he comes up with this three friends concept, which I have to tell you is one of the great concept for a concept albums because it's so it affects all of us this this notion of uh people that we grow up with and and how lives d diverge and converge and it's it's a heavy concept that phil had there yeah no it's it's but it's it's a reality that uh, we all you know we and, and uh yeah absolutely we, uh, it was a good idea and, and really i think pretty well exec executed musically as well as lyrically um, and it, you know, it's, it's, it is reality that we, when we're growing up, we kind of like are, we're all in the same boat, if you like, and then you, you're not in the same boat and, and to get back to that boat is very difficult. It, it's almost impossible. Um, so, you know, it, it was, again, we, we, you know, we were <laughs> the, the other thing about, I think the group, um, 
that you know, we were we were we worked very hard by the way i mean it was just you talk about these these albums we did two albums in a year and, and yeah, so uh, what's a week like what's a work week for giant well, our work week was non-stop i mean we either toured we were either touring or we were rehearsing or we were recording we never we, and that's that's basically what we did for 10 years i mean really it was and and and, on, and truthfully uh and honestly we were not a band that were chemically uh um uh how can I put this? We were uh, chemicals and and other mind altering substances were never on the radar for us. We lots were absolutely of tea, lots of coffee, just, just you know, a pint or two maybe. But on, we were I had to be you know it's, people talk about rock bands and man you had to be really out of it to do music like this. Absolutely not. You had to be really in. <laughs> you had to be absolutely clear headed to to sing you know a seven you know the five four piece harmony that. That carried written on score and scored, uh, and literally you had to read your part. And you know, if you you were stoned or drunk or or high or whatever, <laughs> then good luck to you because that wouldn't happen. So and we that's were very... so funny because the giant bootlegs bear this out. You you are the worst band for bootlegs. Every show is is exactly nailed the same. <laughs> There might be some difference in the guitar solo. There might be some difference here or there. But honestly, it's so freaking consistent. And well, we rehearsed. I mean, and and, and we rehearsed. I mean, we in our rehearsals, we made sure that I mean, every part, every you know, and and our changeovers and and the changeovers of instruments and changeovers and the, the uh, pieces in between again were were something that. It wasn't, I mean, we, yes, we improvised a little bit on you know, Gary, you know, when it was Gary solo or, or a Kerry solo. Yeah, the improvisation over a period of how many bars. It wasn't like, okay, you know, just, we weren't a free form avant-garde band. I mean, that, that let, let it be said, that's not what we were. We were very organized, like, I mean, pretty orchestral, actually. Which I think you, that's, that's what we loved about you. It's, um, it's, some, some people, <laughs> some people thought it was, were, were we too kind of like stiff and out? No, we, we just loved doing what we were doing in, in a very um, organized way. But that's also where John P. Uh, Weathers comes in, isn't it, sir? Because at this oh, yeah. point, it feels so different. Oh, John, John made the huge world of difference to the band as, as, as the backbone of what we were doing. John, his, 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 his drumming was was I mean he did yeah he he was I mean an incredible drummer he could he could do you know every kind of trick in the book but his his um ability to keep that beat on the money you know and and you know whatever beat it was I mean he knew exactly how to make the band rock and I'll say that he was a rock drummer you know and and um, sophisticated and, one oh oh hundred sophisticated by by all means and and his and the snare was so damn hard. Hmm. I've got a party down in the back of my neck. You can't see right now. Because it was the air would like blow up, blow my hair apart. <laughs> but man, he 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 pushed the band with his drumming incredibly well. You know, we all we all did. We all pushed each other. You know, so but his drumming meant a, the world of difference to the band when when John came in, you know, for Optimus. So yeah, it was uh, it was it was it was the right formula. Um and we were on a, you know, on a, on our way to being a mature band. I mean, I, I make an analogy here that you know, in the first couple of records, we were kind of born, if you like, mm -hmm. and then I think uh, the three friends period, and and even Octopus was almost like yes, we were, we we bought, we we grew, we were starting to grow up, we were kind of like adolescent, but we we knew where we were going. John came in, and then. And Phil left, uh, which you know, for him was a, tie, a tough thing for us too. But it streamlined the band, and and to be honest, there was a lot of <laughs> internal conflict. There's all sibling like rivalry and sibling conflicts. It, it made it made it easier for everyone to and for Phil because he was having a hard time, you know, leaving home with kids at home. Uh, and, and you know, in, in retrospect, we understood that, but at the time, um, we didn't realize how poor Torn he was. So after you know, after the um, uh, 
octopus we recorded in a glass house, which was, uh, you know, again, I, I, it's a, such a bizarre record to make. And then, and then the power and the glory of freehand, which I think is the, the, the grown up gentle giant, the sort of fully formed, mature, where, we, where I think the best of the best of the music came from. Yeah, and, and Octopus is such a gem because there's there's really a, a six way thing going on. Yeah. You know, when John and Phil meet, it, it just sort of it, it kind of pinnacles to, to, for the Phil period. And, you know, Phil's vocal complement, Phil, Phil's horns, it, it just it's so orchestral, the whole thing. Yeah, no, the Octopus is one of my favorite. I think one of the fan favorites is one as well. One of our favorite albums. Uh, but we were just, and they, oh, wow, you got the American and British one. Which is your favorite? The, the cover? Yes. Um, uh, oof. That's, you know what? That I think they're both damn great, actually. Uh, I, no, you know, I'll tell you, I think Roger Dean, this is best, I think it's Roger's best cover, you know, across the board. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's his best cover, including, yes, including, also be everything he's done. I think this is, I think Roger thinks this is best as well. It's quite way. striking, quite I mean, striking. He, he, he believes that this is the best cover he's done. Oh, he does? Yeah, yeah, he well, does. I, obviously I know Roger. I, I quite like it. I, I do too, so yeah. Uh, yeah, that one. I like the, I like the uh, American one too, of course, but, but that one, yeah, that's the Roger Dean cover. You know, you know uh, another thing that was was really striking to me growing up, Derek, was that when Free Hand came out, it was on the radio here a lot. Now, I grew up in around New York City, so WNEW FM, Scott Muni, right. you know, Allison Steele. Right. You remember these people, right? Yeah, well, I, I remember because uh, when we come, come over, you know, we were told by our record company that these guys are important. <laughs> no, important from nothing. Uh, but certainly uh, when we were here in New York and, and uh, we go over to NEW and, and, uh, and interview them or interview with them um, and hear them on the radio. And there was a days, I think, of where the DJ uh, and or program director just said, do what you want. Let's, you know, this, you, you're, you're, you're a rock label, just do what you feel is good. And thankfully, that period of time was, you know, when we were making a better record. I, the, the records we were kind of more mature and, and I think, you know, getting to be what Gentle Giant became. Yeah, free, and Freehand is so special to me because I think that's the first one where it hit while I was a fan. So at 13, it's on steady rotation, just the same uh, in, on Reflection and Freehand. All three are getting steady play on NEW. Yeah, actually, I didn't. I, in those days, I didn't know too much about what, yeah. how, what, how much radio meant. But of course, it did. It meant a great deal. Of course, it's all uh, we had. We here. had that, yeah. and and you know, and if we were lucky, we had a record shop, right? And yeah. friends that we could trade with, and friends that would give us Gentle Giant albums. And you got to hear this. You yeah, know? it's very, very, very different today when you friend someone on the, on the Facebook or Instagram or whatever. And <laughs> yeah, of course, it was word of mouth and and. Uh, and, and you hear it on the radio, but of course, radio is semi meaningless in this day and age. I mean, uh, no one listens to radio. But anyway, that, those were the days when um, I think we were lucky in that we were, I guess, being, I didn't know that we were being played on the radio, but certainly that's why, you know, people came to see us, I guess, who didn't know us. It was the only promo really that, that was available. Right. And, you know, apart, apart from, you know, the word of mouth on our live performances, which and we had those you know, magazines for, for a while. That oh, that, that's true as well. Yeah, you did. Yeah, we, we had that. Well, in England, that was always, the, you know, the the, uh, the, tr the magazines and melody makers and NMEs and, you know, kids would read them, uh, not the, the color things that we had here. Um, the, sort of the black and white papers that, you know, told the stories about, and that's where you, that's in fact where we advertised initially to find uh, uh, Gary, you know, we, somebody in the Melody Maker wanted guitarists who could play his instrument. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, no, that, so that was, yeah, you had the magazines in, in uh, so yeah, we were, we were lucky that we were play, being played on the radio, but not to, you know, not, only in certain parts of the, the country. I mean, I think, you know, certain parts of the country were not really uh, um, 
you know, not really interested in the kind of music we were playing. I think the South was a tough nut to, to crack for us, uh, even though you know we played in, we didn't play too much in the South. We, we played, we played certainly quite a lot of gigs, but we weren't as popular in the south, southern part of the US and as we were in the sort of Midwest and Northern and West Coast. Now, when we met uh, years ago through Leonardo Palkovic, uh, I asked you about touring with Sabbath. There must be some pretty strange stories about that tour, but also, I don't know if people realize that Ozzy was a fan, was he not? Well, yeah, he still is. <laughs> and he's, yeah, I'm sure. sorry, is a fan and, and was, was well into having you guys around. Oh, well, we had the same manager. I mean, that, that, man, that, that was a, you know, that was certainly helped by the way, you know, but, um, you know, about, we, we, we knew each other, you know, we knew each other from, uh, from having the same managers and, and Sabbath were, had their own audience and it became incredibly huge almost immediately. I mean, which is, you know, uh, and um, yeah, they were they were fans of, of us, and, and we were actually I like them. I thought they were great when they were when they were when they were um, less uh, intoxicated with whatever substance they were abusing at that time. Um, but they, they, but certainly, first... there's there's heaviness in giant like Advent of Panurge and and things that you know, peel the paint that you can say easily stand up to a a, a Sabbath riff. Oh yeah, we loved we loved those riffs. I mean, they were they were great. Man, Tony came up with some fantastic riffs. You know, that that were uh, you know heavy as hell. I don't think they even knew themselves that they were going to be an icon, an iconic. I'm sure they didn't, in fact, because I know we were we had the same management team. Um, so that's why we got our first American tour with Sabbath, which was in fact the most disastrous tour in the history of the world. Uh, because, wow. uh, well, for the most part, I mean, everyone came to see Sabbath and no one really knew Gentle Giant. And so every night, I mean, we'd go on um, and to, to uh, you know, uh, to a sort of whole, you know, crowd booing us before we even started. Uh, however, you know, um, we were savvy enough, I think, you know, had, because you know, we'd, we'd been on stage, not, it wasn't just our first gig, you know, we'd been on stage. And so we were able to sort of like, Woo them over by either clowning around, you know, with, with Ray with his uh, violin solo, and, and woo them in, or or being heavier and played the heavy songs. So at the end of the show, we we, we got cheers and encores. So you know, apart from what the one last show which we did, which uh, probably everyone knows about, with the uh, LA show, uh, that you know, if if you people are watching, you probably have heard the same story. But that was. Uh, you know, that was the, the LA Hollywood Bowl show, which was uh, the end of the tour. And we, we just had uh, had enough of being booed. And then someone throwing a cherry bomb on the stage was icing on the cake for us. But but that, what's yeah. more what's more metal than Phil telling them all to fuck off? <laughs> well, absolutely. You know, but the right. but, the, but the, the audience was not metal. They just they thought, well, let's get these these crazy Englishmen, let, let's scoot them out of town, which we, yeah, we could well, get off. But we I, came back a year later, and there were crowds everywhere. Um, for when we, we played the the whiskey, I think uh, we for booked for like two or three nights. We had to book seven seven or eight nights because there was, you know, I think those fans who, who booed us off became fans and and started cheering a year or two later. And also, I think at that point, we're starting to get American releases. I don't know if people realize that, like, we are not privy to the first couple of giant records growing up in the States because there's no distribution. So right. that changed with free, Three Hands? No, yeah, for Three Friends. Three Friends? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That changed with Three Friends. That was a really the first album that was released here. Then, then they went back when we became, uh, you know, somewhat popular. And of course, the, the first two were released, but yeah, the first two were 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 were, um, were not released because the record company uh, I think it had to be Phonogram or you know whatever it was or Mercury deemed it too uncommercial to even put out. Um, but that's you know it, it, the third one came out, and then yeah. yeah, well that same thing happened with uh, in a glass house, of course. We didn't get that um, either. No, that was one where Columbia Records 
thought it was just too wacky, too out there to release. And by then, it, which makes no sense actually, of course, uh, by then we'd actually gained a pretty damn good audience. And it became one of the biggest import sellers in the US in, the la in the, those years for Gem uh, and, and the other you know, old companies. It, it sold about four, three, it went, almost went gold in imports, Yeah, which is really bizarre. Anyway, and then we we finally uh, signed with uh, Capital and and with with uh, um, the power and the free the power and the glory and the, the live album and then Freehand etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Power and the glory did very well too, didn't it? Yeah, top forty. Uh, yeah, it's top forty album. Yeah, but it was a yeah. We again, I in those days we I didn't look at the album charts or or know about these things. We were we were oblivious. We were in our we were kind of cocooned. <laughs> in our own world yeah we were i mean it, it, we weren't part of the you know people say all oh, this big prog movement we didn't even think about prog or prog prog movement at all we we, we didn't know about that we just knew the, about, about our music and some of the people we liked you know uh but um who did you yeah, like well i just told you one zappa i mean but uh actually we got on really well and and toured with uh great friends of ours uh, who who helped us actually in, in breaking some parts of the the, the world um, in, uh, with Jethro Tull. Yeah, you know, Ian, 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 we were we were very much. Uh, That's a good fit. Uh, yeah, fantastic affinity, and and you know the band that we we'd go on and they took us out. I mean, with on tour, uh, for about six months worth in Europe and North America, and. Um, it was an incredible fit, but we were, yeah, we, we did really well on that tour and we became close friends because they, there was a lot of respect for each other's musicality as well as, uh, as well as being you know, theatrical. Cause they, you know, at, in those days, you know, people don't remember that Ian and, and Barry Barlow and Martin, those guys were really theatrical too mm -hmm. and had a lot of fun on stage. Mm -hmm. They had little bunnies walking around and mm -hmm. it was very English and we were theatrical too in, in our own way. We, we we like to we like to surprise audiences with our changing of uh, instruments and 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 little twinkly lights when we played the xylophones and that's part and parcel of you know but we wanted to make the audience uh, stay attentive and smile rather than you know fall asleep and wait till the end to cheer. And then I think even Tull was influenced by Giant because Songs from the Wood is such a Giant album. Well, they, I think they were. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, Ian told me so uh, m many years later, uh, and in fact, I, I kind of helped him uh, think about doing the um, the Figures of Brick two uh, uh, album. And I said that was the Figures of Brick. He, he gives me a, a shout out, um, but I kind of like gave him the, the scenario of what he should do because he didn't quite understand how important that album was actually um, when they, when they played it. But yeah, I did. I think. But everyone was influenced by everyone, honestly, in those days. You know, uh, we, we loved, I just mentioned Tull, but we loved Spirit, the group Spirit. Yeah. And that was that was a group which influenced a lot of uh, British groups. I don't know if you know that, but th that was a band that, oh, well, this is a band that influenced Zeppelin, uh, Purple, uh, Z Sabbath, yes, Gentle Giant. I mean, their riffs on... You know, um, you know, clear and, and uh, the, the couple of albums. They were, there were, there was a band that, in fact, Elton John, Reg, turned us onto Spirit. Oh, Spirit is big for you guys. That's interesting. Oh yeah, you know, Police was Ball and, and uh, uh, what was that one? Um, I'm a, I'm something. I, anyway, that was what a great riff. Just, they were they were an unsung great prog band man you know you you missed that band completely i did no i mean the american public i know i, mean, I did were, too i, I should yeah. know better but i i, I admit i did I'm not trucking trucking that was a song this is a riff on that one man it, it, it's it's wow you know what a cool riff that's so interesting because that before they're they're 66 67 they're before yeah, Zeppelin? Is, yeah, yeah, they're, oh yeah, this, Zeppelin stole a whole bunch of their riffs. Purple did, you know, we, we you know, we, uh, I don't think we stole them, we were influenced by them. Yeah. 
No, 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 no stealing. It's just influencing. <laughs> Inspired by. Inspired, exactly. Thank you. <laughs>